I trust that you had a restful Sunday afternoon. Uh, I want to express my appreciation to all of those who had a part in preparing the meal that we had at lunchtime. It was a gastronomical success. And I'm appreciative of all the uh, women and perhaps men who prepared that meal and, and brought it into the building. It was, uh, it was a great meal. We appreciate that. We're blessed tonight to have visitors with us. And I know the congregation here is grateful for the attendance of all, some from the community, some from other congregations. Don and I are especially blessed tonight. The, the Campbell crew has increased tonight, and so we're thankful for that. And we've got friends from every congregation, great friends, and just so thankful to be here with you tonight. Jesus, after he rose from the dead, stayed on the earth for a period of 40 days. And during that 40-day period, he revealed himself to his disciples on a number of occasions. He continued to teach them things about the kingdom. And on one of those instances, when he was together with his disciples, he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Those words are what we often describe as the Great Commission. And that particular text, which we've just quoted, is found in Luke 24, verses 46 and 47. And that charge was, it's the will of God that preaching be done. That preaching be done for the disciples beginning in Jerusalem and then going to all nations. And the message was, God's will is that the preaching of repentance and remission of sins be done among all nations. You compare that message with what we find in the last chapter of Matthew and the last chapter of Mark then we know it's God's will that we go and teach or make disciples of all nations and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, Brother Roger, when you think about that task, that's a big one. That is a king-sized task. If that's your conclusion, then you're spot on. What is the world's population in the year 2017? On April 23rd, well, we're dealing with estimates. You know, when those figures are collected, even those websites to which you go and you ask that question and you seek out population statistics, they're estimates. But there's one particular website which I prefer to use in looking at populations, and it's called Population Reference Bureau. It's really simple. PRB.org. And according to the Population Reference Bureau, the population today of the world is 7.48 billion people and counting. 7,480,000,000 plus and counting. And it's really fascinating and somewhat tantalizing to me as I go to the homepage of that website. When you scroll down, down on the left side of the website, there's a counter. And that counter is clicking all the time with an estimate of the change in the world's population. In one minute's time, 109 people die on average. The population of Bremen, according to that lady that talks back when you ask questions to Google. Yesterday afternoon, we said, what's the population of Bremen, Georgia? The population of Bremen is 6,000 approximately. On average, 6,000 people die every hour. A little more than 6,000. So, so basically in the time that we're together tonight in this service, on average, 
population of Bremen, that statistic is wiped out. And the great majority of those folks are headed to eternal perdition. So as you look at this clock, this, this counter on this PRB.org, it, it's changing. And you can set your clock or whatever timing device you want to use. And right now, here's the way that thing works. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. In three seconds, the population increases by five. Well, you stick with it. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, three more seconds, it goes up six. And it flips back and forth between five and six. What that means is there are people that are dying every minute. There are people being born every minute. And there's a net gain. The world's population entering the 20th century. So Brother Campbell, do you know because you were alive then? I know, but not because I was alive then. The world's population entering the 20th century was 1.6 billion. Isn't it interesting that 100 years later, when the world entered the 21st century, those numbers were reversed. We went from 1.6 billion to 6.1. In the lifetime of many of us, the world's population for the first time reached 3 billion in 1960. So you got thousands of years from Adam and Eve until you get to the point where the world's population at one time was 3 billion. And then from 1960, it only took 39 years to 1999 to get to 6 billion. And that number is on the increase. And so best rough guesstimate right now is the world's population will hit 10 billion if the world stands in about the year... 2053. So that task, that task of teaching the gospel among all nations, that is among every ethnic group, and preaching the gospel to every creature, that task is a big one now, and it's becoming larger with each passing day. But we know this. We know the God of heaven is a God of fairness, and he would not call upon his people to do something that is impossible. You know, when Moses and the children of Israel sent 12 spies to the land of Canaan, they came back and 10 of those spies said, looking at what they'd seen in the land of Canaan, their conclusion was, we are not able. We're not able to go up there and conquer those folks. And you recall, on the other hand, there was Caleb and Joshua, and their message was, we are well able, let's go up at once. And so it becomes not a question of, is the task a large task? It becomes a question of are we ready to tackle that God being our helper. And so tonight we want to talk about rekindling the fires of evangelism. I was explaining to one of my grandsons this afternoon. The Bible says let brotherly love continue. Now in order for that to happen, you have to start with brotherly love in existence for it to continue. So for the fires to be rekindled, rekindled means to renew again or stroke up the fire again. There has to be a fire. There's a need for a revival in the Lord's church where we rekindle the fires of evangelism. Where we get hot and on fire to tell that story we talked about this morning, the message of Calvary. And to tell that story we talked about this morning, the Bible's the greatest book in the world. It doesn't do the world any good. For us to come together and keep that message a secret and say, well, let's preach to one another that Jesus died for our sins. Calvary is a wonderful message. It doesn't do the world any good for us to proclaim to ourselves the Bible is the greatest book ever. It does the world good only when we go and proclaim that message to them. And so tonight, a message of encouragement for myself and a message for, of encouragement for every. Christian that's assembled here tonight and that is let's try to rekindle and keep going the fires of evangelism now I'm going to lay down a definition of evangelism tonight and I will not waver from it we're defining evangelism tonight as teaching or communicating the gospel to lost people let me repeat that tonight as we talk about evangelism we're talking about teaching or communicating the gospel 
to lost people. Let's begin tonight by looking at this reality that Jesus came into the world to be the Savior of the world, and Jesus came on a mission to seek and save the lost. We read that in Luke chapter 19 and verse number 10. About himself, King Jesus said, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You say, well, by Jesus coming into the world, was the world made a better place? It was. But his ultimate goal in coming into the world was not to make the world a better place. A lot of humans have contributed to mankind's good by doing things that are beneficial. They've made the world a better place by their existence. Jesus did not simply come to raise the level of morality. He didn't come simply to make the world a better place. He came to save the lost. And it's now his will that his people be seekers of the lost. Well, what does it mean to be lost? I'm not joking. I'm just trying to be as simple as possible. A lost person is an unsaved person. And an unsaved person is a lost person. Which makes us wonder out loud which individuals fit into the category of unsaved or lost. Well, we're not talking about finding a list of names. But basically, number one, anyone who has ever committed a sin but is not in the Christ, someone who has sinned and is outside of the Christ, they're lost. The Bible tells this in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 beginning, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then verse 24 gives us the good news being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's where redemption is. Well, who said so? God did. And so anyone who's committed at least one sin and is not in the Christ is lost. And the Bible teaches that those who do not obey the gospel of Christ, they know not God and they obey not the gospel of Christ, they're going to be punished with everlasting punishment from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7, 8, and 9. So one group of lost people are those who are sinners outside of the Christ. A second group of lost people are those who have come to the Lord for salvation, but at some point have left their first love. We think about those letters to the seven churches of Asia. And in one of those letters, the first one, in that letter to the church in Ephesus, Revelation 2, verses 1 to 7, Jesus had some commendable things to say about the brethren there. And then he said, but I have somewhat against thee. And he called upon the church there to remember, remember, that's your first R word, remember from whence you are fallen and repent. And do again the first works. If you want to hang an R on that, Jesus called upon them to remember, to repent, and return to where they were so they could be back in his blessing. Those people are lost. And so as we think about seeking the lost, one group of individuals whom we need to seek are those members of the church who have gone astray. Tonight we're looking specifically at those individuals who are still lost outside of the Lord Jesus because of sin and have never obeyed the gospel. What does it mean to seek? Well, think with me for just a moment. Let me, let me throw out some Bible instances, some Bible verses that use that English word seek and also use the same Greek word from which we get seek. We're told in Matthew chapter 2, after the birth of Jesus... King Herod, known in history as Herod the Great. Herod the Great had a goal, and that goal was to kill Jesus. And so when the wise men came there and they had that conversation, that interchange, and eventually Joseph and Mary took Jesus down to Egypt, the message was that the Herod... Herod the Great was seeking Jesus. What does that mean he was seeking Jesus? He was trying to find Jesus. And don't you think he put a lot of effort into that? He did. Matthew chapter 13, there's a, a series 
of parables that Jesus told. And one of those parables is about a, a merchant man, a businessman. And that businessman went about seeking goodly pearls. Matthew chapter 13, verse 45 and 46. So, so Herod was seeking for baby Jesus. That merchant or businessman was seeking for good pearls. Remember that isolated incident in the life of Jesus when he was 12 years old? We got some 12 year olds here tonight. Jesus was 12 years old, went with his parents to Jerusalem to observe the Passover and on the way home. Mary and Joseph discovered that Jesus was not with them. And the Bible's message is they sought for Jesus and then they returned to Jerusalem and they sought for Jesus three days. Now from a mom or dad's point of view, do you suppose for an instant when they were seeking for Jesus that they were yawn, yawn? They were wholeheartedly into that looking in every nook and cranny for Jesus. And then there's another story that Jesus told about a woman, a normal red-blooded woman. She had 10 coins and she lost one of those coins. She's not going to forget about that coin. She's going to look for that coin. And the Bible says she sought for that coin. So, so, so think about those images that the Bible paints for us. Here's King Herod seeking for Jesus when he was a child. Here's this merchant man or businessman going around seeking for good pearls. Here's Joseph and Mary seeking for Jesus when they could not find him. And here's this woman seeking for a lost coin. That's the word the Bible says about Jesus. He came to seek and save the lost. We recognize we are not the Savior, but we need to be seekers. The only way for people to become saved people is for them to be taught people. And so if we don't seek them, they won't be taught. And if they're not taught, they're not bought by the blood of Jesus. If they're unsought, they're untaught. And if they're untaught, they're unbought. We don't want people in Bremen and Harrelson County remaining untaught. So we need to seek. Now, I know it's possible and it happens on rare occasions that people will, out of the clear, blue as we say, they'll seek us out. We'll have people come through our doors that they don't know us and we don't know them. There are from time to time individuals who will call with questions, but for the most part, evangelism is not portrayed in the New Testament as being a sit and wait activity. Evangelism is we go and we do our effort to reach out to people. Let's look secondly to that. Not only do we think about a Savior seeking the lost and his people seeking the lost, but Jesus paints this picture of there's such a thing as sowing time and harvest time. Turn with me to the book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. You might recall the context the setting for these statements. Jesus was going from the southern part of Palestine, from Judea, heading up to Galilee. And unlike many of the Jews of his day, he did not cross the Jordan River to do it. He passed through Samaria. And it was there in Samaria that he encountered this woman at the well, and they had their discussion about living water, and they had their discussion there about proper worship. The disciples, you recall, had gone into town to get some food and came back. Look with me, beginning in verse 34. Jesus saith unto them, that's the disciples, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereon, that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their 
labors. Now, what was going to happen with the disciples was they were going to be blessed by the earlier efforts that people had done. By the earlier efforts that people had put forth, the disciples were going to be blessed. But here's the idea. Jesus talks about a season or a time for sowing, and he talks about a time for reaping or a time for harvest. He's not talking about sowing literal grain, okay? He's not talking about putting wheat or barley or oat seed into the ground. You say, how do we know that? How do we know he's not talking about a, a literal planting of a literal seed and a literal harvest of a literal harvest? Well, look again in your Bible there in verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto what? Life eternal. He's talking about a spiritual sowing and a spiritual harvest. Sometimes an individual or a group of individuals will sow the seed, and the seed, according to Jesus, is the Word of God. When Jesus told that parable of the sower and then he explained that parable, he said very clearly and succinctly, the seed is the Word of God, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11. So here's what happens sometimes. One individual or one group of individuals sow the seed, they work with the person, they work with the family, and they teach them, and they teach them, and there's no visible fruit in, in, in the sense that they don't obey the gospel. Well, it may be that that original teacher, group of teachers, maybe they move away. Or maybe they pass away. Or maybe that individual or group of individuals whom they've taught, maybe they move to another location. And in the course of time... They study the Bible some more and someone else comes along and teaches them. And so it may be the case that several individuals had a part in helping those people learn and obey the truth. It may be somebody back that was their Bible class teacher when they were still cracker snatchers and cookie crunchers. And maybe they grew, grew up coming to services under somebody's tutelage and under someone's mentorship and they grew up and then they, they never obeyed the gospel and they move away or they got busy and then later on someone comes and teaches them. Many times it's not a one person effort, is it? It's everybody working together on the same team. And you know a whole lot of good can be accomplished when nobody's concerned about who gets the credit. We want God to get the credit, right? We want God to get the honor and the praise. And so sometimes you or I might sow the seed and the fruit may not come for years and years. A number of years ago, I went out in the community, and I, I'm going to be honest about it. I did it because it was a requirement in school. I was required in school to try to set up a Bible study. That's why I went. That's pretty brutal honesty, but that's, that's the way it was. So I went out in the community where we were living at the time and, and set up two or three Bible studies. People started taking correspondence courses, and one of the ladies finished it, but we had one or two studies, and that was it. Seven years later, seven years later, I saw that woman at a congregation. She said, do you remember me? And we made connection, and in the course of time, after we had left that area, someone had come and taught her the gospel, and she obeyed the gospel. And Jesus said, we rejoice together, who, regardless of who does the teaching. We rejoice together regardless of whom it might be there at the tail end. You know, we have gospel preachers among us tonight, and, and elders and workers in the church from other congregations, as well as here at Bremen. You know, there have been a lot of instances where somebody else had done the teaching for weeks and months and years, and we just happened to be there in the right place at the right time, and we went and talked to that person, and they obeyed the gospel, and somebody says, wow, you are special. No, we're not special. Somebody plants and somebody waters and somebody gives the increase, right? God gives the increase. There's a principle of sowing that's found in Galatians 6. In verse 7, the Bible says, Be not deceived, 
God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And in the context, Paul goes on to say, if we, if we sow to the flesh, we'll of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the Spirit, we will of the Spirit reap life everlasting. But in principle, think with me. If we reap what we sow, and in the spiritual realm, we sow absolutely zero when it comes to teaching the Word, how much harvest should we expect to have? Should have zero, right? No sowing, no harvest. It's not possible to bypass the soil. Someone says, let's get to the good part. It's like some, some of the folks and some of them are my wife's grandkids. They went through that food line today and it, it looks like the way they ate, they bypassed the healthy stuff and went straight to the sweets. You, you can't do that when it comes to a spiritual harvest. It's not possible to bypass the sowing and get to the reaping. Now remember what we said about evangelism. Evangelism is teaching or communicating in some fashion, oral, written, whatever, the gospel of Jesus. Where there's no communication of the gospel, there's no evangelism. Now I'm going to say something. I want you to listen. And I don't want your heart to get out of rhythm when you hear this, okay? Door knocking or doorbell pushing, that's not a method of evangelism. Got your attention? Door knocking or doorbell pushing has the opportunity to put you and me in closer proximity to another person. You stand in line waiting for your food at Wendy's. You're in close proximity to that person. Are you evangelizing? It becomes an evangelistic activity when you begin to talk about the gospel or pass along information about the gospel. When you work on that assembly line with someone, that's not evangelism until you use that close proximity opportunity to teach them or talk to them about the gospel. Door knocking or pushing a doorbell puts us in close proximity to somebody. It becomes an evangelistic activity when we talk to them, right? Give them literature, invite them, whatever it might be. Now, I recognize, I've experienced it, I've observed it, I know it. I know with some individuals we can better connect with them and make a better bond with them when we develop a friendship with them, have some type of camaraderie. Maybe we invite them over to the house and uh, we cook out. They got kids, we got kids, we play some games. Well, let me tell you something. Cooking hamburgers is not evangelism. It may give you an opportunity to talk to them. It becomes evangelism when you and I talk about the Savior or give them a message. Now, Philip practiced evangelism. You tell me in the book of Acts, when you read about evangelism, what comes to your mind? Paul and Silas and Timothy went to Philippi and had a cookout. We're not at all downplaying the benefit of getting connected with people. I'm just saying don't call playing cornhole evangelism. There's no cornhole evangelism. There's no hamburger cookout evangelism. It becomes evangelism when we talk to people about C-A-L-V-A-R-Y and the message of salvation. A couple of years ago I wrote an article entitled Trying to Evangelize Without Evangelizing. As we're going to see in our next segment, we're going to look at some instances in the book of Acts. When you think about the early saints evangelizing, what do you think about? 
When we send our brethren from here, when some of you go, when we send them to Nicaragua, when we send them to Jamaica, when we send them to India, when we send them to Australia, when we send them to wherever it might be, do we send them over there to drink tea and have crackers and make friendship for 10 days and come? We teach them to evangelize. Talk about Jesus and his salvation. You say, well, maybe not everybody's ready to hear that message. There's such a thing as being wise as serpents and harmless as doves. There's such a thing as trying to get to know individuals and know how to approach them in the best way. But let me tell you something. If I've got a neighbor that's been my neighbor for 15 years or 15 days, if he's not in Jesus, he's lost. And we can play cornhole together until the cows come home, and we can have barbecue together until the cows come home, and we can play golf together or tennis until the cows come home, but he's still lost outside of Jesus. And if he's lost outside of Jesus, when he dies, he'll go to hell and he'll never, never, ever come out of hell. Let's turn to the book of Acts and take a look at the effort of the early saints. Turn with me in your Bible, if you would, to Acts chapter 1. We're going to run some verses. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his apostles, he said, you're going to receive power. Verse number 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and under the uttermost part of the earth. That was the message for the apostles. I know it was a special case. He's talking about them receiving the Spirit in just a few days on the day of Pentecost. But here was the expectation. The expectation was that they would get the message out. They would begin in Jerusalem and go into that portion of Palestine, Judea, and then into Samaria, and then into the uttermost parts of the earth or to the end of the world. That was the expectation. Question. Do you and I still live under the charge of the Great Commission? Do we still live under the charge to go and teach the gospel to every person in the world and maybe somebody that lives across the road from us. It may be somebody that lives 10,000 miles from us. It may be somebody we've never known before. It may be somebody we've known our whole life. It may be a family member. It may be a parent. It may be our kid's coach. It may be the young man that bags the groceries at the grocery store. It may be the woman that cuts your hair. It may be the receptionist at the dentist office. Anyone who's lost outside of Jesus will be lost forever unless they obey the gospel. And when they're unsought, they're untaught, and when they're untaught, they're unbought. The expectation was high, but not only was the expectation high, the effort was tremendous. Now look, I don't have any disillusion to think that in the first century, every single member of the church was on fire for evangelism. I don't have that disillusion. But look in your Bible in Acts chapter 5. As the apostles had been arrested, taken into custody, brought before the Jewish Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin said, we already told you. We already told you not to be preaching in Jerusalem in the name of Jesus. Now look at verse 28. Go back to 27. Verse 27 says, And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. There's the accusation. The accusation was, you have filled the entire city with your doctrine. Would there be enough evidence in your community and mine? In the congregations that we collectively represent tonight? Is there enough evidence based on our efforts to evangelize that our entire communities are filled with the pure, unadulterated gospel of the Lord Jesus? That needs to be our goal. Turn over to chapter 13. And we'll just look at a couple of them. 
Chapter 13, near the end of the chapter, we'll read about Paul and Barnabas in the area of Antioch of Pisidia. And the Bible says in verse number 49, And the word of the Lord was published throughout all the region. And then in Acts 19 and verse 10, we'll not turn there, but the Bible says in Acts 19 and verse 10, when Paul was doing part of his work in Ephesus, that all those who lived in Asia, we think Asia Minor, part of modern day Turkey, all those who lived in Asia heard the word. How'd that happen? How was the entire city of Jerusalem filled with the doctrine of the Lord Jesus? entire region about Antioch of Pisidia filled with the doctrine of the Lord Jesus? How was the entire area of Asia filled with the doctrine of the Lord Jesus? Sounds to me like there was a lot of effort that was put in. Remember, where there's no sowing, there'll be no harvest. But thirdly, as you study the book of Acts, you see this idea of everyone involved type of evangelism. We're all familiar with the fact that in Acts 7, the death of Stephen is recorded. And then as you start over into chapter 8, we're given these details or additional information about the fact that the persecution against the disciples in Jerusalem was so intense that the apostles decided to stay in Jerusalem and the other disciples, that is the non-apostles, they left Jerusalem. Now, from a human point of view, that could have been challenging for some of those folks to uproot their families and move to a new location. But you know what? Something wonderful happened as a result of them being uprooted. What does the Bible tell us in verse number four? Then they or those who were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now it's true in the early chapters of the book of Acts, you and I see the, the apostles taking the lead in evangelism. But when the intensity of the persecution was so great that the disciples left Jerusalem, the Bible says those people in those communities to which they went, they were blessed people because the Bible says in Acts 8 and verse 4, those scattered disciples went everywhere preaching the word. Brothers and sisters, we need to emulate that spirit and be involved in communicating the gospel of the King of kings and Lord of lords to lost people. As Paul was approaching the end of his life, I mean the book of 2 Timothy, it will tug at your heartstrings. Last recorded words in the Bible of a dying man. And Paul's message to Timothy was, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Paul didn't want the work of evangelism to stop when he passed away. Paul understood that Timothy was working as an evangelist, but the work of evangelism is not the work of one person. He knew that Timothy was not a machine who could work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And he knew that sometimes preachers lose their voice. So he said, Timothy, what you've learned, you take your knowledge and you take your know-how and you commit that to other faithful men. The word is anthropos. It's men and women, he's and she's. Faithful saints who in turn can turn around and do what? Teach others I believe, brothers and sisters, that 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2 is God's plan for world evangelism as long as the world stands. Those who have knowledge and know how about how to do it teach others so they can go out and do it also. When we first arrived in Malaysia in 2010, one of the congregations with which we worked uh, asked me to do a series of lessons on evangelism, and their choice was we would do a two-hour class on Saturday afternoon once a month. And so we did that over a several-month period of time, trying to train them to be involved in evangelism. A couple of years later, a couple of the young men of the congregation, I'm sorry, a couple of young women of the congregation 
Earlier when we had those sessions on those Saturday afternoons, they were college students and they were unable to be a part of those. And so they came to Donna and myself and they said, would you have private classes with us? Would you repeat those things that you taught to everybody for us so we can learn how to teach? We got to appreciate that zeal, right? These are young women in our 22, 23-ish. And so they came to our home once, once a week for, for several weeks and we did our best to help train them to teach others. And one of those young women, before you know it, she had a Bible study and that woman obeyed the gospel. And she said, now Brother Roger, what do I do? I said, find somebody else. And she taught that person, that person obeyed the gospel, and she wrote a message, and I wish I'd have saved it. Not to say anything about us, but just to keep her sentiment. You know, here in the States we say, in reference to somebody older, Mr. Mrs. or Miss. In Malaysia they say, Uncle and Auntie. So Uncle Roger, the message came, Uncle Roger and Auntie Donna. Thank you for teaching me how to teach others. I never thought I'd be able to do it. But she took the time to learn. And she took the time to practice. And then the sorry thing left Malaysia and went to Singapore, but kept on teaching people. And now she's down in Australia. And those folks in Australia better watch out. She'll be trying to teach them. And so sometimes that, that, that holds us back. Sometimes we say, well, I've never done it before. Those who have the know-how and the experience need to help others learn how to do it. I don't remember a specific instance, but I'm saying most likely. Most likely there were times in my early preaching years when I got all over Christians for not teaching. And you know what? I had never taught them how to teach. If we're going to put pilots in the cockpits of the airplanes on which I want to ride, I hope they're trained, right? We don't put pilots in the air that are not trained in the same way. We need to take time to train individuals. And I know you've had a seminar here on personal evangelism. But everybody got involved. And then notice this. It was everyday evangelism. We'll not look at those references. But in Acts chapter 5, we read that after the apostles were beaten, after they were threatened, after they were released, they were, they were, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus' name. And the Bible says in verse 42 of Acts 5 that they continued... On a daily basis, they cease not to preach and to teach in the temple and from house to house. And you follow that. Look, I'm not suggesting. I'm not proposing. I'm not declaring that every member of God's church on a daily basis must be teaching somebody the gospel. But surely, surely, in our congregations, by our collective efforts, Surely there ought not to be a day goes by that at least somebody in the congregation is passing along some literature, doing an invitation, trying to set up a Bible study or whatever it might be. And as you study the effect of that evangelistic effort in the book of Acts, you see in Acts 17 and verse 6, do you know what kind of reputation some of the Christians have? They said in Thessalonica, those people that have turned the world upside down have come here. We read in Acts chapter 19 and verse 23, there was no small stir about that way. So, Brother Roger, what kind of guarantee can you give us that if we try to set up 10 Bible studies, that we'll have 10 Bible studies? Can't do it. What kind of guarantee can you give us if I teach 10 people that 10 of them or at least one of them will obey the gospel? Can't do it. Our task is not to predict in advance which people and how many people will obey the gospel. Our task is to seek the lost and sow the seed. And when you and I look at the evangelistic fervor of the saints that we see in the book of Acts, it's extremely encouraging. We've got one final point I'm going to do as quickly as I can tonight. Look with me in your Bible in Matthew 28. Our final point tonight is there's help wanted. You know, it used to be that 
people looking for a job or people looking for employees, they'd run an ad in the newspaper, in the classifieds, right? Well, that's not done as often as it used to be. That, that's old school. But still, there's this concept out there, help wanted or workers needed. After Jesus rose from the dead, a number of individuals saw him. In one instance, more than 500 saw him. But here in Matthew 28, there were some women who had come to the tomb. And the Bible says, in chapter 28 and verse number 9, And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. And so it's a very, very simple instruction. The instruction from the master to those women was, Don't be afraid. And the second part of the instruction was, Go tell. Now, that instruction to go and tell, you reckon Jesus meant it? You say, of course he did. When you drop down nine or ten verses to chapter 28 and verse 19, and the message is go and teach or go make disciples of all nations, do you reckon Jesus meant that? Well, of course he did. Some of you are not alive at the time. Some of you may have been too small to remember. It was the first week of June, 1989. And I remember it with great clarity because we were living in the Republic of China at that time, Taiwan. What was taking place in Beijing, China was throughout the spring in in 1989, there were a lot of individuals who were becoming vocal in their opposition to some government policy. Several university-age students gathered together in tents and protested in a place ironically called Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen. Tiananmen. In Chinese means heaven. An is peace and man is gate or door. The place where they were camping out and protesting was literally the gate of heavenly peace. But if you recall what transpired, it was not a peaceful ending. I believe it was the 4th of June. 1989, the government decided enough was enough. There were those college, there were those students, there were those workers, and there were just thousands of people. And finally, the Chinese government said enough is enough. And they sent in the tanks and the military, and they slaughtered, slaughtered. Official toll in the high hundreds, estimated by outsiders in the thousands. That's one of the first memories I have of CNN or or the BBC giving that type of instant information. Here's why I mention that account. One of the leaders among the dissidents who survived, he wrote a book. And I'm thankful that book's now in English. And the title of the book is Tell the World. And the subtitle is Tell the World What Happened in China and Why. And I read that book. And I read that title, and I think about our Bible class this morning, that C is for crucifixion, and A is for agony, and L is for love, and V is for vicarious, and A is for atonement, and R is for riches, and Y is for yield. Let's take the message of that book, tell the world what happened in China and why. Let's tell the world what happened at Calvary and why the world needs 
to know. Isaiah looked into the throne room of God and he stood in awe of what he saw. And God asked two questions. God said, whom shall I send and who shall go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. You don't have to go on a ship and cross the lake, cross the river, cross the big pond. You don't have to get on a plane and go everywhere, but God wants us wherever we are. Working with our children at home, working with our grandchildren, working with those in our Bible classes, working with our neighbors, working with our co-workers, working with family, working with lost people to tell them about what happened at Calvary and why. The Bible tells us in Matthew 9 that Jesus went throughout all the villages. And you look contextually, it's talking about the area of Galilee, the northern part of Palestine. Josephus was a Jewish historian of the first century. And Josephus, Jose, I can say this, Josephus, Josephus said at that time in Galilee there were 240 villages. So anytime you and I read in our Bibles that Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their villages and preaching in their synagogues, that was not a three, four, or five day gospel meeting. That was a huge undertaking. And the Bible says in verse 36 of Matthew 9, Jesus saw this multitude of Jewish people and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. That's what he saw with this multitude. And then he turned to the disciples and the Bible says in Matthew 9 and verse 37, he said the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. For there to be a harvest, there have to be sowers. And for there to be sowers, there has to be a heart, there has to be a desire, there has to be the time. I'd like to take time tonight, but I've already lost my time. You might want to jot this verse down. It's Mark 6 and verse 34. There's one incident in the life of Jesus. Other than his resurrection from the dead, there's one miracle in the life of Jesus and only one that's found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's the feeding of the 5,000. If you're wondering what did Jesus do before he fed the 5,000, if you were reading in Matthew chapter 14, Matthew 14 and verse 14 tells us Jesus, because of his compassion, he healed their sick. That's Matthew. But in Mark 6 and verse 34, the Bible says because Jesus was moved with compassion, he began to teach them many things. We need compassionate Christians. We need people who care about the health needs, the social needs, the physical needs of others. And we really need Christians who care about the eternal salvation of their fellow man. Tonight, we've looked at rekindling the fires of evangelism, a Savior seeking the lost, sowing time and harvest time. A quick glance at the book of Acts the early saints getting the word out and help wanted. More workers are needed. We look back to Calvary as a source of our hope. And we look to heaven as the fulfillment of our hope. And we sometimes sing the song, Oh, who will come and go with me? I'm bound for the promised land. Tonight, if you've never put on your Lord in baptism, if you're still yet outside of the Lord Jesus, would you not tonight come in simple faith, turning from your sins in repentance and confessing your faith, and then to arise, to be baptized, to wash away your sins and walk in newness of life. Whereas a child of God, if you need to come home, it's God's invitation as you stand and we sing together.